imports appeared no better in higher spending regions, it remains possible that the increased use of specialist diagnostic tests and hospital-based care led to better functional outcomes, quality of life, or satisfaction with care. That, of course, is what patients are looking for. The authors also reveal in their study, uh, re reveal that their study does not address the question of how the amount of care for an individual patient in a specific case would affect that patient's clinical outcomes, and that they do not know if it is possible to reduce Medicare spending without affecting patient care or patient outcomes. And finally, they admit that it's not always clear whether such services as specialist consultations are wasteful or beneficial. That is a whole lot of inconclusiveness. Yet, they claim that if the U.S. could standardize spending at the lowest spending levels, Medicare could save 30% annually. Yet, they have no idea how it would impact patients. Even the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare has come under fire for their interpretations of quality. They claim that lower cost care is higher quality until the New York Times forced them to admit, to admit that they don't even study quality. They only study cost. Yet the Obama administration promised Democrats in Congress that the Institute of Medicine would be asked to, quote, consider ways of putting the Dartmouth findings into action by setting payment rates that would punish inefficient hospitals and reward efficient ones, end quote. <coughs> Thus, they would inflict pain and suffering on patients and doctors using the findings of a study that had nothing to do with quality. So ask yourself this, should comparative effectiveness research lead to government control of your doctors under the guise of quality? The second word is evidence. It sounds good, but it's less scientific than you may think. Many want to force doctors to practice only according to evidence. There are several questions you should ask when this topic comes up. The first question is, whose evidence? What studies were used? Which were ignored? Who did the research? What types of patients were excluded from the study? What are the bias of the researchers? Do the findings conflict with other researchers, as in the highly publicized hormone replacement study? And who funded it? Even the Institute of Medicine admits that the findings of studies depends on who did them. They write the following. There are gaps and inconsistencies in the medical literature supporting one practice versus another, as well as biases based on the perspective of the authors, who may be specialists, general practitioners, payers, marketers, or public health officials, end quote. Now consider these additional questions. Do you really believe that medicine has been practiced all these years without evidence? Do you believe that the U.S. has advanced in medicine, that Saudi kings come to this country for medical treatment without evidence of effectiveness? What would it cost to secure the evidence that everything that we do today produces healing that is actually healing patients? How many people would suffer or die before the evidence is secured? Today, only about 20% of what we do in medicine actually has, quote, evidence. Yet, here we are advancing every day. The New York Times sends out an alert about the dangers to innovation. It says, Insisting that new medical devices, drugs, and procedures be cost-effective from the start is a dangerous approach. If handled clumsily, it runs the risk of chilling, promising research. Once Medicare begins to bulk at paying for something new, private insurers will not be far behind. Here's a case in point. Researcher David Cutler found that revascularization is associated with over one year of additional life expectancy at a cost of $40,000 after looking at 17 years of Medicare data. He calls it highly cost-effective. What happens when a highly effective technology isn't allowed to prove itself, isn't allowed to go forward because the committee doesn't have enough evidence? And what happens if you're a rare case? The studies haven't been done, but there are ideas from your doctor that might work. Even the CBO, when it was headed by Peter Orzog, admits, Having the evidence base keep pace with the rapid development of new medical treatments and technologies will remain an ongoing challenge. He also says there is a danger in accepting research on its face. Because, he says, studies with narrow findings may mean that treatments effective for subgroups of patients might be eliminated because they were considered ineffective for average patients. So there's at least three dangers with comparative effectiveness research that I'd like to tell you about, as well as its financial penalties on doctors and patients. Number one, 
rationing. To meet government preferences, biases, and budget constraints, there will be denial of care, delay of care, and limited access to innovative, customized therapies. Number two, the demise of the practice of medicine by critically thinking doctors, the kind of doctor we all want when we really need one. Why should any smart young student pick medicine as a career? After 11 to 17 years of study, the government will tell him or her to turn off their minds, pick up the computer, follow the embedded practice protocols that come up on the screen, and face penalties, fines, decertification, delisting, and delicensure, even charges of fraud and prison if they don't. Number three, the end of the confidential patient-doctor relationship and the end of patient trust. This is a biggie and most people are not thinking about it or talking about it. The entire enterprise of comparative effectiveness research and its associated physician control mechanisms like quality measurement, practice protocols, decision support, and pay for performance are all based on data. They rely on government access to the private medical records of patients. Uh, through the so-called HIPAA privacy rule, 2.2 million entities have access to your medical records without your consent or knowledge. That includes the government. The Obama administration and Congress gave $20 billion in the stimulus bill to jumpstart a national health data system. The law also requires doctors to have electronic medical records that are interoperable with the system by 2014. The federal reform law also is high on other areas of surveillance, including major wellness and prevention provisions requiring identification and tracking of the unhealthy, the unexercised, and the potentially expensive individual. Once citizens figure out that their doctors, clinics, and hospitals have become the center of government health surveillance and control, it will lead to destructive behaviors meant to protect their confidentiality and limit government access to the de details of their private lives. A California healthcare Foundation study back in 1999 found that 15% of the American public were already taking evasive actions to try to protect their privacy. And that was before most of them even had an electronic medical record. What this means in the doctor's office is less confiding, less truth, attempts to avoid going to the doctor at all, a greater degree of illness when the patient finally decides to go, and higher healthcare costs as a result. These protective activities will also, also skew medical research, which is and will be used for comparative effectiveness research findings. So this leads me finally to uh, four suggestions for action. First, implement informed, voluntary, written patient consent requirements for access to patient data and sharing of data and getting onto that national health information network that's coming. And that, that means consent, not dissent. That means opt in, not opt out. HIPAA states, um, HIPAA allows states to implement real, true, patient protecting, constitution abiding privacy protections. Second, encourage the private cash based confidential practice of medicine. One way to do this is to pass the Freedom of Choice in Healthcare Act, which ALEC has crafted and six states have already passed. Third, protect baby DNA from government analysis and ownership. Many states are now retaining baby DNA after newborn screening for research purposes, all without parent knowledge or consent. It's considered state government property. Imagine how government ownership of citizens' DNA going far into the future could be used to decide what treatments you can and cannot have. Fourth, limit and eliminate healthcare entitlements. Healthcare should be provided privately and charitably where it will cost far less than it does through government bureaucracy, regulations, and paperwork. Government entitlements have raised the cost of healthcare for all of us and now threaten to extend government control over all of our medical decisions. My final admonition, think carefully before you accept by faith or fancy words the concept of comparative effectiveness research. Your life and the lives of your constituents and others may depend on it. Thank you.